Today's show is sponsored by Indie Film Hustle's Filmmaker Process. We provide filmmakers with professional services to get their films or series funded, finished, and distributed. For more information, go to filmmakerprocess.com. I'd never written a script before, and it leads into my very first script. Well, I wrote a short script, a 32-page screenplay, I've never written one before, called My Dinner with Hervé. And I thought, this is great. It's a short about the most famous short man in the world. You know, what I didn't understand is that I'd written essentially an unmakeable $2 million short film that once someone looked at it, they were like, Paris in 1940 and Barbados in <laughs> San Paolo. Like, who's paying for this? And I was like, yeah, that was <laughs> Anyway, um, it became an interesting thing because I wrote this script from the heart to feel like, I felt like the newspaper robbed me of the truth of that story. And so the script was my first attempt to tell the story from a truthful point of view. And um, I, I, it ended up being read by Steven Spielberg. I mean, that script that I was, you know, got to Spielberg. You, you know, mean, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I was, I was, the 32 page, $2 million yeah. short film about my dinner with Herbert, unmakeable. With Unmakeable. Co- called my di- my e- my dinner with uh, with Hervé, about the yeah. most famous short man in the world. That script, how yeah. did that thirty two page script? Well, that's another story. You see, as as <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Well, so okay, here's the story. This is a crazy story. So I <laughs> had applied to UCLA Film School, and sure. I was really on on the fence about whether I wanted to go. And I got for whatever reason, I got I applied to UCLA. So I was in that LA doing all these interviews, Hervé and the kids from Beverly Hills nine hundred two one zero. By the way. On the mm-hmm. same trip that I interviewed Hervey, you know, when he pulled the knife on me, yeah. the interview I was going to was the kids of Beverly Hills 90210. That's who I also interviewed. So mm-hmm. I'm like, all I'm sitting there listening to these imbeciles talking about this terrible show. And all I'm thinking is about Tattoo shiving me and what was going to happen next. And I'm like, I was so disinterested. Um, I was a 24 year old. Anyway, so I, it was just so weird. Anyway. So I was, I was basically, um, I, I applied to UCLA because I was in LA so much and I'd all, I went back to the original dream. You know, I was, at, I was at school and I started my film club and I loved film and, you know, I really wanted to see, if, you know, UCLA was a legendary school, you know, that so many fantastic filmmakers and I was a huge, I am a huge Paul Schrader fan mm-hmm. and Paul Schrader had been at UCLA and Alexander Coppola. Payne. UCLA and, Coppola, and just an extraordinary and, and USC seemed to be like the you know really successful rich kids and UCLA was the kind of you know messy disaster kids <laughs> it felt like anyway it was much cheaper I couldn't yeah. afford it. <laughs> so I just applied to UCLA and I got into UCLA and so I was in LA my mom said go to LA I knew not a single person not one person and so my mom had an old friend um called Ruthie uh, Snyder, who she grew up with in Toronto. My mother came from Toronto and then had moved to New York, whatever, and then to England. And um, she said, look up my old school friend. You know, she hadn't seen her in like 30 years. I was like, great, I'm all hooked up in LA. I have some woman I don't even know. Anyway, so she was very kindly introduced me to her daughter, Fonda, Fonda Snyder. And what happened was I got invited. She said Fonda was running a company called Storyopolis, which was a bookstore in, in, in L.A., opposite the Ivy restaurant in Robertson. Mm-hmm. And Paul Allen, the, you know, the Microsoft guy, was funding this kind of children's bookstore. And so she said, oh, we're doing a dinner. Do you want to come? I didn't know her at all. Anyway, so I go to this dinner and I, and I get there early because, you know, I don't know anyone at all. I'm like, you know, I'm talking to the waiters. What, like, year are we, what, what year are we talking? It's like 90. Three, two in there, 92, three, four, four, 94 even, right? Something like that. Yeah. And anyway, so I'm in my suit, like, because I'm very English. I'll put on a suit, they right. can't fool me, whatever. So I go there and I look at there's these long tables and they're having a dinner to honor the incredible author, Maurice Sendak, who did mm-hmm. Where the Wild Things Are. Yeah. So, and I'm looking at this table and I'm looking at David Geffen, Peter Guber, you know, but like the people coming to this dinner were it's- like, and so Fonda was like laughing because she, she thought I was going to some kind of, you know, like free festival. Mix, some but mixer. I, I, what yeah. I, was, I didn't know what I was talking to. So she thought it was very funny. So anyway, so I see all these kind of luminaries. Oliver Stone was at the dinner, I think. And, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. So I'm nervous as hell. Because you should I, be. I'm no one. I have no idea. I'm smoking red Marlboros, like, without stopping. I've smoked two packs. Anyway. 
So I go outside and I'm watching all these Hollywood luminaries through the windows. If you know where, where New Line used to be opposite the Ivy, the Storyopolis was all glass and they had this kind of little area, piazza area with benches. So I'm sitting on the piazza benches, watching through the windows as like Oliver Stone and David Geffen and all these people arrive going, what am I doing here? I, can't, I'm, I was thinking about going. Anyway, so this tramp comes up to me who was like wearing some sort of that kind of grungy Seattle look or whatever. And he was sort of a bit befuddled and he sits down and he says, you know, do you have a cigarette? I was like, sure. So I ended up chatting with him and we started talking and smoking cigarettes. And he was a very nice guy. And he said, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm English. I'm actually here. I think I'm going to go to film school. And, you know, and he says, really, what, what, what are your plans? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to become a screenwriter. You know, I, I'm going to be a screenwriter like that. And he looks at me and goes, huh. And I literally remember thinking, I looked at him and thought, maybe I can help this guy. Maybe I can just give him, I don't know, some money for the bus or something. I don't mind. I'll help. He seems nice. So anyway, so we're chatting. We're getting on incredibly well and talking about, you know, America versus England and the favorite yeah. TV shows. And I can't remember, but it was great conversation. Mm -hmm. And we're big cigarette smokers. Anyway, so. I'm watching the assembled mass through the windows. We both are. And this very beautiful woman comes out and goes up to this tramp. I thought perhaps to give him money. I didn't really know. But she comes up to him. It turns out it's her husband. Okay. And she is coming to this event. And by the way, he is coming to this event. And I'm like, okay, they're letting the homeless in. It's like an <laughs> all open community. I mean, we've got the luminaries, but we're also we're working with the streets. So I, so I was basically just like okay so who's the, anyway whatever so she says who are you and i said well i'm sasha javazzi i come from london i'm going to ucla i'm going to be a screenwriter and elizabeth says oh really that's what my husband does the tramp and i'm like oh okay so so who are you oh he, he's called steve zalian he had lit oh my god the oscar the previous year for his screenplay for schindler's list so I could not speak. Oh my I have God. literally met one of the greatest living screenwriters. Yeah. Ever. Forget yeah. it. Right now, then doesn't matter. Unbelievable. And so anyway, we go into the dinner. I'm like freaking out. Elizabeth finds it very funny because I'm like, you're Steve Zanian. Okay. And you're Elizabeth Zanian. Okay, great. So then <laughs> I find out that I'm seated like three seats away from him, my card, you know, uh, next to the head of new life. You know, I, <laughs> anyway, Steve, sees me freaking out and he finds it hilarious was he's, this he's steve, steve just yeah. found it funny as well so they're all like laughing at me and anyway so i couldn't speak after that because i felt like i behaved like such a dickhead like there i am proclaiming i'm a screenwriter and there i am next to the academy award-winning writer of the, so the equivalent of me of, of 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 a kid going to steven spielberg you know one day i'm going to be a, a director <laughs> Right. Not knowing that that was Steve Spielberg. I felt like so, I went into a massive shame spiral. And I remember just eating all the food and picking out on dessert. I was trying to eat on my feelings. It was so, I was so nervous. I felt terrible. I felt like an imposter. And I felt like I'd really made a fool of myself in front of essentially, I'd never seen him, but I'd read all his screenplays. I'd read Searching for Bobby Fischer. I'd read his uh, awakening script. You know, uh, the guy uh, was extraordinary. I'd, I'd uh, you know, I'd, uh, there was so, you know, Serpentine. Another script of, I mean, of, of Steve's, of Bad yeah. Manners, whatever these things were, you know, he was just an extraordinary, him and Bob Town to me were the guys, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like meeting him, made a total fool of his, anyway, at the end of the dinner, he comes over to me and he said, here's my phone number. If you want to have a coffee, let's have a coffee or whatever. How many, really, how, 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 how many days are you in LA at this point, once you I've, arrived? I haven't been there that long, like three weeks. <laughs> I've arrived in LA. I know my mother's friend from high school in Toronto, and oh I'm meeting God. literally. By the... So anyway, oh so my God. now I had written that my dinner with Herbe script, right? But I didn't know what I was doing. But I had this script. So he said, "Do you have anything you know that I could read?" And I said, um, "I have this script." And I told him the story of meeting Herbe, and he found that story very interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so I ended up sending him the script to where to where, to where where he lived in Santa Monica. I sent him the script um, and I didn't hear anything. As you know, yeah. And I was like, okay, I've met Mick Jagger, I've given him my demo tape and I'm a loser. <laughs> and I made a fool of myself and I offered basically to give him bus money home. I mean, it's just like, 
a full on disaster from start to finish. Anyway, so I was in my little hundred dollar a week apartment that I was living in West Hollywood and the phone goes and this is like three months later. It's Steve's alien. I'm so sorry for not getting back to you. I've been on a project that's finished now. I just happened to get to your script and I think it's really good. Would you like to have coffee? I drive down to Edrix in Santa Monica. In fact, my friend Adam dropped me off because I didn't have a car. Because remember, for, for, well, for the first two, three years in LA, I did not have a car. I was traveling by bus or walking, which was fine, right? Oh, so I was yeah. going to, I got dropped off at Diedrich's. I had a coffee with Steve. And he said, I think this is special. I think you're a writer. I think you're right to go to UCLA. And I think this is a very important and special piece of work. And I was just like, Jesus. I've never written anything. This was the first thing I wrote. In, and, and so in the end, without getting into it, because there's lots more, obviously, to chat about, he gave that script to Steven Spielberg. And so I found myself on the set of Armistad, you know, 10 feet away from Anthony Hopkins, you know, right on the, on the set with, with, with Steve introduced, because Steve was also working on that, had rewritten that whole thing, was introducing me to Steve, Steven Spielberg. And I just couldn't believe it. And he complimented me on the script and said, would you like to watch? And was could not have been nicer. And ultimately, that ended up, that led to me working with Stephen on the terminal. So it was all through Steve's alien. Like, literally, had I not had that chance meeting with Steve, had Steve not been as cool and generous and so unpretentious and kind with me, he was just extraordinary with me. Extraordinary. Like, you know, in life, when you get people who suddenly appear in a certain moment and they're yeah. like angels, that's yes. exactly what his alien was for me. He was absolutely an angel. I would not like everything that's happened since that moment. I would have absolutely no career without Steve and his belief in me. And and at times when it was really, really tough, you know, and, so, and I actually, yeah, anyway. So, all right. So you basically had and I've talked about this a lot is because, I mean, so many screenwriters listening tonight and filmmakers as well who are listening, you you. You look up to people like, you know, Steve Zally and, and and Spielberg, and and I I can I consider them to be gods on Mount Hollywood. They're literally like Greek gods in Mount Hollywood. And when one of them decides to come down with the peasants and touches you on the shoulder, is like you now shall be a screenwriter, you now shall be a director. That literally happened to you. And and he was and he wasn't even. And the funny thing is, if I if I may go full Greek mythology on you, he was like hidden <laughs> so you yeah, I, he was like in that, disguise almost thank god because i was totally myself i had right. no idea who he was i didn't <laughs> i was giving this guy cigarettes and possibly giving him bus money home and possibly when i became a screenwriter helping him when i discovered he too was a screenwriter you know? oh my <laughs> god just, no it was, just... oh, it was like magic because had i know look i'm very like had i known it was steve's alien i would have probably completely clammed up and of not course. been who i am and so therefore it was a massive gift. It was like such a weird and wonderful thing. And, you know, he and his family and Elizabeth and, and Nick and Charlie would just have been fantastic. Well, I have to, I have, yeah. so I have to ask you because, I mean, and I've spoken to other people on my show as well that have had these kind of magical paths because this is a, this is absolutely lottery ticket. This is magical uh, in so, so many ways. Do you believe in and in, in, there has to be some sort of fate in this because the chances of this happening, do you uh -oh. believe there are other things that, that kind of guide? Because I do, I truly do. Like when doors are supposed to open for you, they open for you in a magical way that you just can't understand. You know, how, yeah. I, how I get, how I have had the opportunities to talk to certain people on my show, like yourself and like what's happened to my show, what's happened to my career, all these other different things. When something's supposed to happen, it happens in a way that you will never know. Like, if I would have told you this exact story when you were flying over to LA to, to go to UCLA, you would have said, you're, you're mad. You're mad. If I would have told you that tattoo was going to be the catalyst for your yes. entire career, you would have said, that's right. You're insane. So and also, what, what do you, so what do you, what's your feelings on that? Also with him threatening me with a knife. Obviously. I mean, that's, that's, that's a given. I mean, but the, whole, but the whole thing I do, well, how can you ignore that? I mean, there's obviously something going on. I'm not saying that goes on for everyone all the time. No. It doesn't go on for me all the time. But I think there are certain critical moments in life 
when things happen, when you meet someone. And I think it's all about being open and recognizing it because, you know, a lot of the time you don't recognize things. Yeah. So oh, but I got very lucky because, you know, without getting too much into my personal story, I had a really, you know, a pretty bad time with drugs when I was younger and I, you know, nearly was not here. Mm-hmm. And I think when I got out of that, was able to figure out, like, actually, I don't really want to, I actually do want to be here. And here are the, and I, when I sort of got clear of that, um, I just saw everything in a strange way as a, as a, as a huge blessing, because it's like, you know, whenever things would be going badly, you know, I would say to myself, you know, for a dead man, you're not doing that badly. <laughs> you know, I'm alive. I may, and I definitely have that appreciation of life at a very basic level. I don't take stuff for granted. And so I think when you carry that energy, perhaps you invite sometimes positive, perhaps even negative, but, but in this case of very positive things, you know, I, I was recently kind of, um, you know, in recovery, clean and sober when I came to L.A., like coming to L.A. was all about a completely new beginning. Mm-hmm. And I think when you've been through a tough time and I'm sure many of your viewers and listeners have been through their own version of that, you know, you know, that there's something about getting through it where you just you want to live. Yes. <laughs> and that brings stuff to you. And I think that that maybe that was an example of that. I don't really know. Um, mm-hmm. But I was just, you know, I think when I nearly, you know, when I nearly was not here, it's very humbling. Oh. I think that, you know, like I think the problem is I see a lot of Hollywood, you know, screenwriters sell their first script for a ton of money and then it all goes to their head, you know. And, and I had that later, I actually have to say. I had to call myself on that, you know, because it does affect you, right, when people start telling you all this shit and you have to really watch it and um i would say as a writer as a writer particularly in hollywood you know if you don't seek humility it will find you (laughs) it will find you amen brother amen you will be fired you will be you know taken down and denigrated and all that stuff and so you know and actually steve zayn gave me a great bit of advice he said it's a roller coaster when it when the corner gets squeaky squeeze on tight just hold on you know and i think that i've always done that there have been some terrible terrible moments as well as some extraordinary moments and i think that um you know it is about not being a wanker <laughs> if you can i think i'm being you know when people, when people like that like i think what happens is you get these moments of grace and clearly that was some kind of a miracle with steve you know it's when the ego cuts in and it starts taking credit for all that shit, you get into a lot of trouble. So you have to just mm. count your blessings and go, thank you, rather than start making it about you. And that is something that, you know, we're all prone to at different times. But you've got to watch for that. And I, I've certainly, if I haven't been watching for it, I've learned the lesson the hard way. I, I mean, the ego is the, I mean, listen, the ego is one of the, the, the thing that we all fight every single day. And I believe in the in the film industry, more so than ever because man it is so it, it is it's so I mean, enticing like, oh, a screenwriter God. having an ego is kind of like you know that knight in the monty python <laughs> who gets his arm knocked off and then his leg it's just a flesh you know, wound it's really a flesh wound and then he's like a quivering stump you know that's like a, a screenwriter with an ego. come here come here i'll take you <laughs> It's like, you know, you better not, you know, it's just a waste of your energy. You just better get real and take your breaks when you get them and and pass it on. That's the key thing. Yes. Like if people come into your path and you feel, even if you can make it like a tiny difference, but, you know, you know, don't delude yourself into thinking you could do what someone like Steve Zalian or Steven Spielberg could do. But if you can actually help someone, even if it's reading a script or listening or whatever, you know, do it, man, because you got given that times 10. And I think it's in a strange way, it's, it's your duty to do that. It's to pay it forward. It's that's pay what it was done for you. You know, so uh, that's, I just think if you're coming from basically a place of honesty and fairness and trying not to be a tosser, trying not to be, and catching yourself when you are, mm-hmm. then, you know, you're going to be all right. You're going to go, you're going to survive the crazy turns of the roller coaster and the ups and downs and the rapids in the river. And there will be plenty, as I'm sure, you know, most of your you know writers know it's just very you know and you can go from the hottest thing to the coldest and the hot you know and it's like try not to pay attention to the temperature reading focus on the process and the long-term plan because you know today's hottest screenwriter is tomorrow's coldest i've i've got i've got the best reviews and the very worst you know it's like you'll have all of it 
try not to get buy into it too much. I think just focus on, okay, I've got to deliver this script and I've got to deliver this movie or whatever. Stay in what at, you do, you know, and don't worry and, about the other bullshit. And look at Hervé. I mean, look, I mean, he was the hottest, biggest thing. Totally. In, in, yeah. I mean, in the 70s, you couldn't, you just couldn't, he was everywhere. I mean, he was, he, he was so hot and look where he and, and, and that's ends the, up. That was the lesson of the Hervé story. And yeah. it all went to head and he got into it with Ricardo Montalban and he wanted a trailer as big and, and basically spelling fired him because he was completely out of, you know, out of control. And, you know, he, he was destroyed. He went from, you know, a, a, a TV star on an ABC show getting 30 or $40,000 a week in 1979, 80, 81. Jesus right? Christ, yeah. Um, to, you know, when I found him having to flush his toilet by taking water out of his swimming pool to flush the toilet because the water had been cut off. You know, it was really extreme. So yeah, he yeah. was a kind of example to me, you know, and I also felt for him because there was clearly, he would realized that he'd kind of completely fucked himself, you know, Jesus. and his ego, you know, his ego was not his amigo, as they say, you know. It, <laughs> well, I like that. <laughs> it blew everything up. So anyway, yeah, I mean, there, are, there are so many examples of that, you know, of, um, just don't take the work seriously. Just don't take yourself too seriously. To watch the rest of this interview, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv.